Hello everyone, my name is Daniel. When scraping the web with Python, you might find it rather difficult to organize your workflow. But there must be something to make it easier, right? In today's video, we'll take a look at two tools that make web scraping tasks easier. E-commerce scraper API and Apache Airflow. We have a lot of interesting content to get through, so let's get right into it. For our demonstration, we're going to use a mock website called bookstoscrape.com and Oxylabs' e-commerce scraper API, which is going to help us collect the data in an easy manner. Let's start by building a wrapper for the e-commerce API. First, create a class that accepts your API credentials, username, and password. Then, create a method that submits the URLs that you want to scrape. The endpoint accepts two parameters in JSON format. Source, the universal underscore e-commerce parameter indicates we're using a tool specifically designed to scrape e-commerce websites, and URL, a list of URLs for scraping. Next, we need to check if the URL has been processed. To do so, we call the queries endpoint and include the ID we get upon creating a job. If the content has been successfully scraped, you'll see the done string with the response status field. Now we need to build a method for fetching the content. For that, we're using the queries results again, including the job ID. To see if the content has been returned, check the status code. In our case, we have 200, indicating that the content is still available. We should be able to retrieve the content by accessing the results key of the dictionary. Let's also replace the HTTP status code with a constant to make the code easier to read. After fetching the job ID from the API, we'll need to store it in a job queue and keep an eye on it. To do so, we'll create a table for queue jobs with the PostgreSQL database. Now we need a sequence that generates IDs for each newly inserted job. First, add the ID and use the previously defined sequence. Then, add the fields for tracking when the job was inserted and updated. These fields will also monitor the job ID and its status. As you can see, by default, the status is pending. We now need to define the class that will work as an intermediary between us and the table. Since we're going to use transactions, let's define a cleanup method with the at exit function and carry out transactions that are in progress. Now, let's define the setup method that will do all the heavy lifting. First, check if the table we want to create already exists. You can do it by querying the information schema. If it does, you should print some useful text for easier debugging. If the table doesn't exist, run the query we talked about before to create it. Since we're planning to run a bunch of parameterized queries, let's define a helper. Now we can define another helper for easily changing the job status. Let's also describe the method for refreshing the updated underscore at field. This is important for later. Next, create a simple method for inserting the newly created job into our queue table. Since using strings for statuses isn't a great coding practice, let's plan out the constants for them right away. Now, we're defining the most important method for our queue for fetching the next job. We want to lock the record so no other instances can read or update it, so let's start a transaction. Then, we fetch a single job from the queue table. Let's make sure it hasn't been updated in the last 10 minutes so we don't spam the API. Also, let's make the ordering random so that we prevent our queue from getting blocked if a job fails. Lastly, let's use the status helper to delete the jobs and mark them as complete. Now that we have queue and client classes, we'll be using them in nearly all of our scripts. We also need certain configuration options, so let's define a bootstrap file. First, let's describe the variables for a connection to the database. Then, define the variables for Oxlabs' e-commerce scraper API. Fetch them from the environment variables while providing some reasonable defaults. Now, we're using the db variables to create a connection. We can now create instances of the classes we created previously, one for the client and another one for the queue. Now that we have all the main classes initialized, let's build a script that creates a schema for our queue. Since we only need to set up the queue, let's just call the setup method on the queue instance. We can now push all the URLs we want to scrape. Once the request is complete, we can go through the jobs saved under the queries dictionary key and add every job ID to our makeshift queue. For the puller script, we fetch a single item from the queue and double check if we haven't reached the end of available jobs. Then we check if the status is not yet complete in the API. If it isn't, we use touch so the record isn't instantly refetched. If the API says the content for the job is available, let's mark it as complete in our queue and print it. In a product environment, you could also save this information in your database. First, what is Apache Airflow? It's a community-created platform that authors, schedules, and monitors workflows. 
Let's set it up following their official tutorial with the official Docker Compose file. First, we download the Docker Compose file using CURL. Before we run Docker Compose up, we expose the files we created in the SRC folder. Now we create the necessary folders and set the environment variables. Once that's done, let's run airflow-init to initialize the Apache Airflow for the first launch. You'll also need to set up a database for our makeshift queue. While the script will take care of setting up the actual database, you still need to create the database and the privileges for the user of the database. Now you should log into Apache Airflow with the default Airflow slash Airflow credentials and explore it. You'll see a bunch of examples. Feel free to click on them, check the graph tab, and experiment. Airflow uses a DAG, which is a set of tasks that are ready to be run. It is organized in a way that reflects their relationships and dependencies. A DAG is defined in a Python script, representing its structure and code. To create a DAG file, we have to create a Python script in the DAGs folder. Let's create one for the setup script from earlier. First, we create a Python script in the DAG folder. Then, we specify the default arguments for the DAG, such as the number of times the Apache retries its execution before giving up and delaying. Next, we create a DAG object called setup. We inform Apache Airflow that the process needs to be executed only once, on the 10th of February 2023. Finally, we create a task that is attached to the DAG and runs our setup script. Now, let's go back to the dashboard and use filters to find the DAG we just created. Click on it and explore the already set up tasks. In case things go wrong, you can check the command line output. You can do that by clicking on the task and selecting logs. Now's the time to create our push-pull DAG. Let's copy the setup DAG and modify a few parameters and set it up to run daily. While we're at it, let's update all the names and descriptions. Now comes the most powerful part of Apache Airflow, the dependencies. We can define two processes, push and pull, and make pull dependent on push. To see the visual representation of our changes, we click on the grant. Our DAG has a glaring issue. We want to execute push once as it uses the batch endpoint, while the pull task needs to run it multiple times. Unfortunately, tasks in the same DAG can't use different intervals. Although you could solve it by creating several DAGs, Airflow offers better solutions for managing the dependencies. Let's take a look at Short Circuit Operator, a powerful tool that skips tasks if conditions are not met. To use short circuit operator, we have to change the interval to the smallest possible value. We also need to add a filter function is underscore midnight, so the push processes it runs only if that function returns true. Then we attach the function to the once underscore per underscore day short circuit and make the push task dependent on it. Reload the page and take a look at the graph to see the visual representation of the changes we just made. Finally, let's combine our task into a single workflow. Again, let's modify the name. Then, use a special variable called prev underscore start underscore date underscore success to see if any previous runs exist. This way, we can define a condition with the lambda, which prevents the setup task from running if any previous runs exist. We call the task trigger underscore once. For all other tasks, we define trigger underscore always, which is the opposite of trigger underscore once. It's a fairly easy way to layer tasks, even if you're using a single DAG. Congrats, you have now successfully built a scraping pipeline using Oxilabs' e-commerce scraper API. We also have this tutorial available as a blog post. The link will be in the description below. If you have any questions about the tutorial, feel free to reach out to us via email or leave a comment below. To access more content like this, be sure to subscribe to our channel and give a like to this video if you enjoyed it. This was Daniel and we hope to see you again in another video. Bye. Thank you.